that visible light especially passes through the atmosphere. It doesn't, it doesn't get absorbed by gases in the atmosphere. So short waves, visible light, the atmosphere is pretty transparent. So that light energy gets to the surface of the planet. That warms the planet up. Okay, just like um, you know, shining a very intense light on a, on a black ball, on a bowling ball, you'd end up warming up that side of the bowling ball. So that warms the planet. Now the planet radiates energy back out. It doesn't radiate light. It radiates infrared or, or thermal energy. That has a longer wavelength, and it turns out that that gets absorbed by the atmosphere. So the planet warms up, and it radiates out energy in a longer wavelength, which we call thermal or infrared energy. And that gets absorbed by the atmosphere. There are gases in the atmosphere that are transparent to visible light, but they absorb infrared light, or infrared radiation. And what that does is it heats the atmosphere up, and it keeps it warmer than it would otherwise. <coughs> and that warm atmosphere radiates heat energy back out to space, but it also radiates it back down to the planet. That's the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is an atmosphere that traps infrared radiation, it warms up, and it keeps the planet warmer than it would, would be otherwise. Now, what people often think about the greenhouse effect is that it's, it's, a, it's a recent result. It's a result of um, the, you know, industrial activity, the release of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The truth is any planet that has an atmosphere made up of gases that absorb infrared radiation will have a greenhouse effect. It's a, if you want to think about it, it's a natural, the greenhouse effect itself is a natural phenomena of having an atmosphere on a planet. Okay. And in fact, if you, if you did, I have my students do this at a graduate class, you can calculate how much energy is coming in from the sun and based on the size of the earth and its temperature, how much energy should be radiating away from it. And, and if you do that balance, just based on our distance from the sun, the Earth should actually be a frozen ball. It would be 33 degrees colder on average than it really is. The reason that it's warmer and habitable is because we have gases that trap that outgoing infrared radiation and keep the planet warmer than it would be otherwise. Okay. So that's, and, and, and this is basically how that works. This is, this is shortwave light coming in. And then when the planet absorbs radiation, it, it sends it back out as long wave radiation, okay, that infrared radiation. And these are the gases that absorb it. So methane absorbs some, nitrous oxide absorbs some, we can go down the list here. I mean, these are the greenhouse gases. And water vapor is one of the most important. Water vapor actually provides about two thirds of the greenhouse effect on the planet. Carbon dioxide is important, methane, nitrous oxide. Um, What's, and, and, I, and I like this, I'll point this out before I talk about the, the, the current problem with the greenhouse effect. Um, this was described a long time ago. Uh, Svante Arrhenius, uh, who eventually won a Nobel Prize, he was a Swedish physicist and chemist, did a lot of different things, but he's the, one of the people who's credited with first uh, discovering or thinking about the greenhouse effect on planets. Um, and he did this back in 1896. It's a long time ago. And he, and, he, and he realized that if there are gases in the atmosphere that absorb infrared radiation, they should heat the planet up and keep it warmer than it would be otherwise. And he did a bunch of calculations. And even at that time, he suggested that hey, we're burning a lot of extra fossil fuels that are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I, I, you know, I understand that carbon dioxide is part of the greenhouse effect, but what will happen if we increase the concentration of carbon dioxide? Well, he, he argued that would probably increase the greenhouse effect and raise planetary temperatures. Remember, he was doing this in 1896, right? Yeah. Okay, I want to restate what I think I heard you say. If I'm wrong. The output, the heat, is equal to the input. The output is trapped by the gases in the atmosphere which reflected back to the Earth, thus heating up the planet. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. But if you looked at the top of the atmosphere, the amount going out still has to equal the amount coming in. You're absolutely right. But it heats up the, it heats up the atmosphere, and that's what keeps things warmer. So the, the, pro, the contemporary problem with the greenhouse effect is this. These are the major greenhouse. Water vapor we're not going to talk about, because water vapor doesn't change much. Unless it gets warmer, then you get a little more water vapor in the atmosphere. 
But the other greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, um, these are data from contemporary measurements or from trapped air in ice bubbles. So um, air, sorry, air that was trapped in bubbles in ice can be extracted from these really deep ice cores taken in Greenland and the Antarctic, and you can analyze them. You have to be very careful not to contaminate them with the current atmosphere, but you can analyze the atmosphere in these bubbles, and it represents past atmosphere gases. And when we do that, we can see that the things that are increasing in just the last century or so are <coughs> carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. That's where the contemporary greenhouse effect problem comes, is that th those gases are increasing in concentration. And all the models predict that should increase the temperature of the planet. But in fact, if you saw the headline news in on CNN yesterday and several other news outlets, there was a recent report released that's gone back now 11,000 years looking at different proxies for temperature and basically noting that the, the rate of temperature increase now in the last century has exceeded anything we've seen in the last 11,000 years. That's, that's since the last uh, ice age. Okay, so that's where people get, you know, are concerned about climate change. The greenhouse effect and climate change are related, but they're not the same thing. And the climate <coughs> within the atmosphere has a greenhouse effect. Contemporary climate change is largely driven by the fact that that's changing on our planet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, the, that's the rationale for that. Oh, what's, so GWP, you, it's global warmer, sorry. Yeah, it is, I'm thinking greenhouse, but it's, it's global warming potential. And, and that's what the GWP here refers to. It's a relative index of how much each gas, molecule for molecule, can contribute to heat. And the way they do this, it's all relative to the CO2. So we say one molecule of CO2 has a global warming potential of one. That's just a relative amount. Each molecule of methane has a global warming potential of 23, 23 times every molecule of CO2. And each molecule of nitrous oxide has a global warming potential of around 300. The reason is the global warming depend potential depends on where in the infrared spectrum they absorb. So if the nitrous oxide absorbs in regions that are different than CO2, then it adds to the warming effect in ways that are different than CO2. And it also has to do with how long the gas lasts in the atmosphere. The average lifetime of carbon dioxide is about five years. The average lifetime of nitrous oxide is about 120 years in the atmosphere. So that's why it's a much higher greenhouse global warming potential. Once it gets there, it's going to persist a lot longer. Jill? What are some uh, anthropogenic sources of nitrous oxide? Yeah, so, so, so nitrous oxide, um, there are some industrial sources. Uh, nylon production is one process that releases nitrous oxide. It turns out most of the nitrous oxide actually comes from bacterial activity. And it's involved in nitrogen cycling. So bacteria, when they cycle nitrogen, they produce nitrous oxide as a byproduct. The reason we think nitrous oxide is increasing globally is because humans have made nitrogen much more available around the planet through the process of, of fertilization production. By producing fertilizers, we've essentially doubled globally the amount of nitrogen fixed. And all of that nitrogen floating around in the biosphere comes down in the rain, in fact. We measure that in Kanza. But all that nitrogen that's being circulated, microbes transform it again in the soil when it gets there, soil or water, and they release nitrous oxide as a byproduct. <coughs> if you wanted to, there's a couple of processes, um, nitrification and denitrification are the two major processes, but basically it's, it's bacterial processes. Methane comes largely from wetlands, but it also comes from livestock production. And carbon dioxide, of course, has a variety of sources, it's respiration, but also, but the, what's, what's primarily contributing to this increase is fossil fuel combustion. And there's very easy ways to, to look at that. Um, fossil fuels, when they're burned, they produce CO2, which has a different um, isotopic signature than the CO2 that plants or animals are respiring. And you can actually see the change in the isotopic signature in the atmosphere. And you can clearly see if that's a signal of fossil fuel production. The reason this fossil fuels have been in the ground so long, essentially they lose all their C14. When plants and animals are respiring carbon, the CO2 they respire has a C14 signature still in it. Stuff that's been in the ground for a very long time doesn't. 
So what's happening is the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the concentration <coughs> of CO14 is actually decreasing over time as a result of burning fossil fuels. You had a question? Um, the, uh, the productivity of um, bacteria uh -huh. to make uh, fuel for cars then would not be a good idea. It's, well, it, it depends. The, the bacterial processes that make this are very specific. And so if you were using bacteria just to break down organic matter to make ethanol, they wouldn't necessarily be making nitrous oxide. It's, it's only certain bacteria that do that, the ones that are involved in nitrification and denitrification. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question too, though. It's not all bacteria, it's just, it's just a few specific ones that are involved in those nitrogen cycling processes. Uh, when you convert natural gas into uh, anhydrous ammonium fertilizer, that would be a major source of this nitrogen oxide eventually when that fertilizer is used? Eventually, that, yeah, it has to, yeah, the fertilizer has to be transformed used. first, yeah. So like if you're putting on ammonium or ammonium nitrate fertilizer, the plants will take up some of that. Some of it remains in the soil. That ammonium that's there, if it, if it gets nitrified by that, the bacteria converted from ammonia to nitrate, in that process, they leak nitrous oxide back to the atmosphere. And then if that nitrate gets denitrified, that means converted back to nitrogen gas, microbes that do that in the process, nitrous oxide is an intermediate compound. So when those processes are happening globally, they happen in soils and sediments everywhere. I mean, it's, it's, it's a natural process of part of the nitrogen cycle. But when you provide more nitrogen, it's, it stimulates that cycle globally, and along the way, those microbes that are leaking nitrous oxide are leaking more of it. So it's really hard to control. You know, CO2 potentially, especially if it's fossil fuel production, you know, you can regulate that eventually. Um, the nitrous oxide is a distributed uh, uh, product of something that happens in soils and sediments around the planet when you add extra nitrogen. So that's that's something that's going to be very hard to regulate and control. Um, one, one of the ways to deal with that, well, that would be, of course, more efficient <coughs> fertilizers. Designing ways so that the fertilizer, uh, fertilizer that we add, targeting particular crop plants, for example, is used to the maximum extent by those crop plants so it doesn't just end up in the environment. Okay, so that's, that's the greenhouse effect. And again, I mentioned you know, the, the earth is, is warming. That's pretty much, you know, that, there's very solid evidence for that. I mentioned the study yesterday. These are just, you know, looking at temperature and anomalies over the last, well, since 1860, and you can do things like, these are, these are a little, it's a year out of date, but I could probably add another data point. You know, the warmest years since 1880 now, uh, seven of the last 12 um, years were statistically tied as the top warmest years since 1880. Yeah. But everything you say is true, but however, in the past, the theological past, not as fast as now, but we had tremendous times of oh, sure. global warming. And today, we put out so much information that it doesn't even tell us about that. It's all about what's happening now. We realize humans adapted to climate changes, and they always will. That's why we're here and other people aren't. And I, I, I'm on the other side. Don't say that global warming is causing all of our problems. But, you know, no, no, I, I wouldn't say it was causing all of I know you're not, but, 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 but I'm on the other side that, you know, that, that let's tell the whole story. Okay. Yeah, no, so, so, so the whole story would be that, in fact, we have much higher CO2 concentrations um, about 700, 800 million years ago. We peaked, well, actually, not higher than now, not at that time frame. Earlier than that, in geologic history, we have. Prior to the evolution of, of a lot of plants and animals that exist today, and we have had higher temperatures even within the last 11,000 years. What we have not had is anything that rep so right now what, what's in, in, in that, that science paper that came out yesterday. In the Holocene, the last 11,000 years since the we are actually in a period where we should be cool. The beginning of the 19th century was was us entering an interglacial cool period. Instead of that, we're at one of the warm, we are at the warmest period in the last 11,000 years.